much research do you do for your book, and do you like doing that? Is it hard to um, tear yourself away from doing it? Yeah, all, all of the above is true. <laughs> I love doing research, and I'll, I'll, I'll like everything where this started off with me, like looking at studying anger, literally, and I'll study like intermittent explosive disorder, which sounds more like a bowel problem, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> like, just a, but there are these people who like explode into rages. Um, they're often in cars on highways. But uh, so that was interesting to me. So I'm looking at siblings and, and, and murderous siblings and like just, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I literally look at everything from like in this case, like the history of prisons or, you know, what happens when this happens, you know. And so in order for me to write what I would say is like sort of solid fiction about or committed fiction, I have to actually know what I'm talking about. If I'm writing a book set in California, I literally will read about like plant life in California because I it, it's like, I have to know more than I'm going to use because otherwise I, I, I don't have the confidence to do it. Um, and yes, at a certain point I have to like stop myself, especially now with the internet, um, because it's just years can go by. And you're like, well, you know, didn't know the web got so big. Um, you know, because all of a sudden you're looking at some like, you know, the German translation of whatever, and oh, that's interesting. And this has a lot of stuff about Nixon in it. Um, and that for me was very interesting because I had always been interested in Nixon. Nixon was the president when I was growing up in Washington, so he sort of loomed in my childhood in, in odd ways. Um, but it was interesting to see how much both the history and the knowledge about the impact of Nixon's presidency had resonated moving forward in ways that I didn't even know. And it's, I mean, the simplest, biggest example is Nixon opening relations with China. And China now owns more U.S. debt than any other country, and you know, all of our stuff is made there. That's also why people, critics haven't picked up on this, but there's all these threads of like Chinese people through the book, including one that to me is hysterically funny, which is when they go, uh, Harry tries to go and meet with the rabbi, and he calls and this Chinese woman answers the phone at the temple and explains that she's uh, adopted and that the family who got her came, they didn't like the baby they were offered, so they just took an adult. <laughs> it's just like, just like horrible, but I think it's, it's like in a, in a Cohen Brothers way, kind of very funny. Um, and then she tells him that he can't talk to the rabbi until he makes a donation, and that what he offers also isn't enough. Um, and his credit card doesn't go through. I mean, I love that. So little things like that. But yes, lots of research. I went out to your Belinda to Nixon's birthplace, uh, but I only realized recently I got a snow globe there. That's you know Nixon's birthplace, your Belinda, and I. So recently, it's on my Facebook. Fan, fan page, whatever that actually is, I'm not sure. But I shook it and took a picture of it. The funny thing is I realized, it doesn't snow when you were Belinda. <laughs> so I've got this, like, this problematic snow globe. It's like lemons coming down, or, you know, whatever. Anyway, anyone else have a question? Yeah. Well, you said it took you seven years to write. Was that, I mean, how, what was that time divided up into? Suffering. Suffering again, <laughs> and then in the refrigerator, and then suffering. <laughs> you know, it's really, I mean, it's, I'm not a fast writer, and I really do rewrite a lot. Um, so in order to keep moving forward, I have to go back and kind of like, I'm constantly sort of pushing backward you know, and forward at the same time, like some weird, I don't know, buffing and sanding machine. Um, and then you know, as I'm going forward, I also, I don't plot things out, but I take a lot of notes. So I'll write things down that maybe will happen, or I think about what the trajectory for the character needs to be. I always am sort of asking, what's at stake for this person? What, what is their journey? And, and, the, and with Harry, it was interesting because I really didn't know what was going to happen. I thought for a long time, this is just going to have a horrible ending. Um, and then I sort of felt that in literature, it's easy to write down. It's easy to write to some moment of, of just demise. Um, and that's in many ways also part of the literary tradition. Like, oh, what happens if the roller coaster goes down? And then you've got to get it back up again. And in a way, it's hard to write optimistically. So I wanted to try that. But it had to also be organic to the character. So you think, well, what has to happen to him? Um, and I wasn't sure it was going to work. I mean, I wasn't sure that he had it in him because he's not like the easiest character. What if it didn't work? What would you have done? I would have had a more depressing book. Or a thousand Yeah, I don't know. I mean, no, because at a certain point, it would just have to stop. I mean, it can't. It can't go forever. And it's interesting because the where it stops now, I think happened because it seemed that they were in a safe place for me to leave for a while. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like they're done, I don't feel like it's over, but I thought, well, at least I can just, I can, I can go to the bathroom now. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, one of the things that fascinated me about the book was that um, it was 
Often in literature, things happen to the characters, and then they resolve, or the characters learn from them, they go through them, and, and that's sort of it. In this book, things keep happening right. to these right. people. And actually, I find that a little, not to reveal too much about myself, but I find that a little bit like life right. more. But I wonder about your decision to do that, um, especially, I mean, what Ashley is a good example right. of that. Right. I mean, I think the, the, uh, the, you know, on the one hand, I think a novel is a compression of life. Because I think if you just documented everyday life, I always ask myself, why, do you, why should the person who's going to read it stop doing what they're doing and start reading that? So I want it to be, I, think it, I keep describing it lately as the difference between grape juice and wine. If I'm going to spend all this time writing it, I want to make wine. I really don't want to just make like mozz, you know, whatever, <laughs> apple or gray, or like, you know, oh, that was delicious. So can I have more, you know, white Concord grape? <laughs> um, it needs that distillation. And at the same time, I actually think, and I tried to do this pretty overtly this time, I think everyday life really is, at this point, slightly absurd. And it is kind of in that weird way. It's sort of unrelenting. What happens to people's families, what happens to all of us, the amount of stuff that we're trying to sort of parse and get through. And, you know, there's not, there aren't moments in, in contemporary life that you just have periods of rest for several months where nothing happens. I mean, <laughs> look at this last week in New York City. I mean, it's, you know, we're living in a different world, uh, literally, than, than in the 1940s, the style of, even the way novels unfold. They used to start, you know, it was a pleasant summer day when Hank went to the top of the hill and surveyed the, you know, they used to unfold in a very different way. And now there is that sense of compression. I think our lives for lots of different reasons, you know, both just the, the economics and the number of people and the technology are much more pressured. Um, so I think part of it was about reflecting that, but also in a way that, that highlights, I think, both the, the humor and the absurdity and the impossibility of it. There was, I mean, I was really thinking about how do you be human in the midst of all this? So, yeah. Are you writing anything else while you're working on this? I wrote some book reviews, I wrote some articles, I wrote a couple of TV pilots, um, which never got on the air, because um, you get health insurance when you do that. You get <laughs> All you get when you write novels is you get lunch with your editor, and now they even, a lot of publishers have limited the number of courses of lunch you can have. <laughs> it's true, you used to be able to have like a long lunch, now it's like you get a main course and like, you know, maybe dessert. Um, and you think I'm kidding, I'm not, they'll actually have to tell you, oh, I've only got you can only, you know. It's, it's, yeah. Um, so that yeah, but mostly I really worked on. I mean, it's a it's a really long book, and you know I realized that like, I mean by comparison, a lot of novels are 250, 300 pages. So this was like basically two. Uh, you know, in pay extra or anything. So, um, I'm not going to do that again anytime soon. I, I have to say it was also. I don't even think I knew what I was doing and how exhausting it was. On the other hand, I'm super proud of it's really layered, um, and I I. I feel like I worked extra hard at thinking, like, it's a Emile Foy of a novel. Um, <laughs> but there are, there's like the Nixon layer and there's the internet and technology layer, which is, it, is not just the internet, it's, it's interesting. And, and there's a weird iPad moment in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and there's this two, the evolution of these two children. Um, and there's also, I've put a lot of stuff, I had never done this before, but there's a lot about sort of Judaism in there, which was like a whole other thing that for me felt like a risk because I never sort of talked about that part of my life, and I, and I did it in a way that's both humorous, which means it will upset a lot of Jews, but also true um, in terms of just detail. So there, there are many, many layers. And it's like, you know, there's a rabbinical student who, named Ryan who drops <laughs> out um, of rabbi school and goes to work on like an organic pig farm. It was just things that are hard, you know, very absurd. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah. So that, that took a lot of extra time. Did you ever connect and disconnect to the subject matter while you were, like, did you have periods where you were not fully connected to the book and then reconnected? I mean, a little bit. You know, for me, those, and I think that some of those are sort of natural things, if that's what you're asking about. I think for writers, it's, it, it's hard to sustain. I always think of those periods as um, sort of moments where the thing has to work itself out a little bit, but that's literally, I'm so sort of, at least until I finish this, so hyperactive, now I'm just exhausted. But that's when I would write an article, or I would teach, or I would go do something else. 
Um, you know, and sometimes just for even for like a week. And on the one hand, it's very hard to do all that because I think it's it's a lot to juggle. And I often felt like an air traffic controller, like I'm sorry, I can't do that article till Wednesday, or you know. And then all the time feeling the novel, you know, needing attention and wanting attention. So I don't know that I would ever do as much again. Um, but I tend to be somebody who takes on a lot of stuff, you know, just because it's yeah, who I am. Yeah. What is your discipline as a writer in terms of how do you structure your time? In my fantasy, I'm very disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I like to, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I like to go to work first thing in the morning. You know, it, when I go to places like Yaddo, I get up and I have to work before breakfast because I think I have to like earn my breakfast. And then I like to get what I would call three sessions of work in a day. So I work before breakfast, and I work till lunch, which is sometimes right after breakfast. Um, <laughs> and being, yeah, that's the one of the jokes you get as you take your lunch after you leave breakfast. And it's like, did you eat lunch at 9.30? Um, so upsetting when that happens. Um, and then I try to work a little bit in the afternoon or in the evening. Um, you know, in New York, I mean, I'm very, I'm involved with Penn. I do all these other things, so I don't get necessarily as many hours every day, but I pretty much, you know, I work every day. I used to, before I had a child, I worked seven days a week. Now I usually try to work six. And when you say work, does that include the research time? Yeah, well yeah. No, it's, I, I mean, it's like, you know, I'm at my right. desk all day, and the truth is if, if, you know, a little kid didn't come home, go, hey mom, I'd probably, yeah, cause I'm, just, I'm always, always right where she left me. I'm like, come right here, you know. Um, you know, she comes in, she like, finds me like flat out, the, like today, my back is going down, I'm like on the floor of my office. I'm like, hi. <laughs> Can I use the computer? I'm like, close all my files, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just work all the, you know. I, I can't, you know, I love it. I mean, that's the thing, I don't, I can't, I can probably write like new material at the most four or five hours a day. I find actually writing very, very tiring. It's like it comes from like the middle of my brain and it's exhausting. And Kathy Harrison and I used to have this, this joke about like, did you lie down on your pages yet today? Because we'd always like print stuff out and you just think, I'm just going to rest for a minute. Like, we really are this <laughs> See, so, yeah, I have like ink all over. There's always, you know, there's always like your pillowcases like weird writing on it. I'm like, what's that? Um, it's tiring, you know? I don't know. Never writing that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I never. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, ahead. go. Let her go, and then you okay. can go. Then you can go again. <laughs> um, I just want to say I really have loved your writing for many years. Uh, I haven't read all your books. It's okay. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, that they're. You know, they're not always about pretty things, or mostly they're not about pretty things right. or pretty people. Right. Um, I did really like Harry. I just. I really liked this character and this transformation. Um, but I was curious when you talked about how you saw your writing of this book mm -hmm. uh, as sort of painted pictures, yeah. and words. Yeah. Do you, have you ever, I'm a fine artist. Sure. Like, have you ever done any fine arts? Have well, yes, I have. <laughs> I, um, I, went, I went into art school at the Corcoran in Washington, and I studied painting, and then I studied photography, and I do a lot of collaborations with artists, so I've done books with Eric Fischel and Rachel Whiteread and Cecily Brown and a bunch of people. Every year I do two or three books with artists, um, which usually, I used to write art criticism like for Art Forum, and then I realized at a certain point that I wanted to sort of push that out a little further, so I spend time talking to the artists about why they make what they make and what it means to them, and then I actually sort of make a piece of fiction for them that's a combination of sort of what they've told me and my own response to their work. Um, and it's, it's fun and it's, it's, it's in lots of ways it's sort of hard to do, but I like it. I had one that I did uh, for Rachel Whiteread, who's this very talented British sculptor. And she's a little bit unusual. And I, I remember writing it, I think, oh, this is getting too weird. She's going to hate it. And there's a part in it, it's sort of about a shapeshifter. And Rachel actually casts usually negative space. And she, so she's done these casts. She actually did a, a really beautiful Holocaust museum in Vienna, I think it is. Um, but anyway, so I had this thing where this woman is a shapeshifter and has, a fe has feathers that grow out of her. And I thought this was really pushing it. Um, and I gave it to Rachel and she said, God, that's amazing. I once knew someone who had a feather. There is a quality to her that is kind of magical and a kind of otherworldly. 
and she she works with in, a, in essence kind of memory or memory of what was once there um, in a way that's anyway so so all that to say I really yes I do that and I, <laughs> and I look at a lot of art and in a lot of ways I feed on art more than I feed on literature just because the truth is at the end of if I'm really writing a lot I, I can't read again at the end of the day, but I can look at pictures and I go to museums and usually in whatever city I'm in, I go to the museums, no matter what, what it's a museum of. In fact, I was just in Manchester, England, and I was all excited because there was a museum of hats that I could really get there. Um, but yeah, I, it's just it's one of the ways that I like, somehow to me, always being in, in a museum space is very calming and very just kind of organizing. So. Yes, you have another question. Well, I was just going to say, so I came into this book reading it, having read a couple of your other books. And while I was reading it, I was thinking, you know, this is interesting because here is a woman who clearly, to me, has a soul and appreciates beauty, whether it's the beauty of a moment or a spoken word. While at the same time, you write, some of your books are so violent, so incredibly violent. Where does that come from? <laughs> You know, I mean, it's a, that's a very, it's a complicated question, right? and I'm not sure exactly of the right answer to it. I think a couple things. One is I really think the books come out of the culture we live in. They come out of, I'm a big consumer of news, I'm a big consumer of sort of psychology, not like psychology as in like, you know, popular psychology, but psyche. Um, there, you know, like Music for Torching Ends with a Shooting at a School, that book came out three weeks before Columbine, which was our first large scale kind of school shooting. People could say, how did you know? I thought, because I'm looking at the culture, I'm looking at where we are. So I think that I think that there is a kind of violence that's under the surface. And apart from that, I also think that a lot of us sit on a lot of emotion that is very volatile, which doesn't necessarily mean that it should express itself violently. Um, but I think that it's funny to say, like, it sounds sound like such a non sequitur and so awful. You know how like Andrea Yates, like someone who like kills her children, or they, and this happens all the time. There's always these mothers who are killing their children, and I think it's interesting that everyone goes, oh, "That's so shocking! How could that happen?" And then when you have children, you think, well, "Of course you could kill them." <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's not that you would kill them, but that that intensity of feeling and 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 the what someone can provoke in you. And you're talking about a woman who's like forced to homeschool her children, who doesn't get out of the house, who's miserably depressed. I mean, again, not that I would advocate that ever, I wouldn't. But I think, like, it, it's our fear of, of finding those feelings in ourselves that stops us from understanding them, if that makes any sense. That we're so afraid that we might actually feel the same way, we don't even want to think about it. And I think one of the things I specialize in is somehow articulating all the things that we don't want to say out loud or think about, you know what I mean? And I guess I've worked hard to not be afraid of that. Um, in some way. I've been in therapy since fourth grade, so I think I'm making the progress. I missed a few weeks because of the book tour. I'm a little nervous. What might have happened while I was gone? You know. What are you doing in August? Well, they all go in August. Why doesn't go in August? I don't know. No. I go. I actually, I, I, I gotta get out of here. You know, no. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, other than going to the Hat Museum, what did you do in my hometown of Manchester? Well, you know, funny, I have family in your hometown, so, which I didn't get to see. I did a, a, a talk with Jeanette Winters, and I taught a class at the university, which I really, really liked. Um, and I got to go back, because I just think it's a very, very cool city. I brought some, some soccer shirts, um, <laughs> Man, Man City and uh, uh, what, what, uh, Welbeck. Man United. Emmanuel, yeah. Yeah, well, I know. Very stressful. I didn't know which to get, so I got all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sound like, sound like Harry. Exactly. I know. Well, yeah. Did you have a Yeah, I just want to follow, follow yeah. up to the violence thing because um, Lips has early on that act of violence against mm -hmm. Jane, and then later it has that instant reaction that Ashley has mm -hmm. on the road there mm -hmm. where she, you know, which has to do with her being a girl. And then it has sort of a, it's not quite violence, but what happens to her at school. So right. throughout the whole thing, there's an issue with women in violence. Um, sort of. Yeah, I mean. Or was that just how it unfolded for that character? We could also look at the end of Alice then and say that to the jail yeah. pedophile murderer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's interesting. I've never thought about it in that way. Um, 
because I also feel like the women, it's funny, I, I feel like the women in the book books are equally capable of violence. Like if you look at, in, actually in the end of Alice, there's this young predatory girl who takes the scab off this kid's knee and eats it. Um, I'm not telling it well enough because you're not grossed out enough, but. Um, <laughs> So I think that I think that I, I guess I believe that both men and women are capable of it, and I and I would be wary of thinking that, that there's just violence sort of you know that happens to women. Right. But I think I mean so, you know I'm sure in society more there is more aggression towards women than not. Mm -hmm. Why not? No, I'm just no. Um, anyway, I'll stop there on that one. But mm -hmm. I'll I'll think about that and, and look at it. Try to write a different book next time. <laughs> I was just gonna say um, when I, because I've only read 125 pages, uh -huh. but I read uh, music mm -hmm. for torching. Um, so I'm kind of here to introduce me. But I find the way you write is what goes through your head. Like if I'm sitting here right now, yeah, and you're talking, but everyone's brains are in different places. Sure, like, of so course. you're just you're just putting in the writing. So I, I like that you yeah. sort of articulate things and say like you know things that people wouldn't say. Right. Well, I think one of the things I'm always trying to write about is the is the gap between our sort of public and private selves, mm -hmm. um, and finding language for those things that, that and, and I think that that gap is becoming in a peculiar way kind of collapsed, which is why there's so much internet stuff in the book because I think that people are engaging in kind of internet conversations or an internet persona that. Uh, mm -hmm. Is, is somewhat risky in the sense that it's not who they are in their daily life, but nor is it who they are exactly in their family. It's like some other sort of peculiar creation that interests me, but also worries me. So, yeah. Did you have a question that you were going to ask before? Someone? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. well, yeah. Second to last question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess uh, maybe just to kind of Keep going from that question. In contemporary sort of literature of the yeah. day, do you find yourself drawn into you know other authors who are kind of writing the same thing? Is there anyone out there that you're kind of reading a lot at the moment? Well, I don't think of people writing sort of the same thing. I mean, I think you know the things that I'm drawn to. It's it's a mix because on the one hand, I I tend to read. Um, so I say I tend to read a lot of applications that are submitted to various organizations for things. I tend to read for a lot of prizes, um, which limits my personal reading time. Um, I read for myself. I go back and I read like the, it's where the the influences for this book I would say come really from Joseph Heller and obviously Cheever, Norman Mailer, who I never read because I always thought, oh, Norman Mailer's so mean to women, I hate him. And then I started reading, I'm like, oh, he's actually a pretty good writer. Um, <laughs> I had no idea because just for years I thought. He's just a bad guy. Uh, and you know, it, I mean, whatever. He might have been sort of an asshole, but he was a good writer. Um, and then in sort of contemporary things, I mean, there's lots of different things. That, like there's, there's people like, there's a short story writer named Brad Watson, who I don't think that many people know. And I, I read his stuff, and I was actually completely blown away by it. I thought he was like kind of a, a you know, not to compare whatever, but sort of like a new, like a comic of Raymond Carver and Flannery O'Connor, which is hard to do. Um, you know, there's a new book by a woman named Joan Wickersham that I really love. It's very different from what you would think, oh, that's going to be the kind of book she likes. Um, you know, I, I, I like reading biographies, actually. I'm really, into, I'm really into economics and politics, and I also like science and like black holes. I mean, that's the kind of realistic research I'm like, I mean, if I'm reading just for myself, it tends to be, it's going to say, it tends to be more nonfiction. Um, but then when I go and read fiction, I'm always, I mean, I, I like it. It's, it's always a, like a really pleasant surprise. I think there's a lot of wonderful writers writing right now. And a lot of different voices, which also is nice. You know, there's not just one kind of fiction at the moment. Anyone have one last question? Well, this is a, it's more of an observation than a question. Yeah. But just now when you were mentioning other yeah. contemporary writers, I think you only mentioned men. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> one of the things that, that so just kept yeah. amazing me and reading yeah. your book, yeah. May We Be Forgiven, is that you were writing these things, you're a woman mm -hmm. and you were writing right. this way and talking, using these expressions yeah. and this whole situation. And I, I don't remember reading another woman author right. who 
write like that. Right. I can say a couple of things. I did name Joe Wicker Sham. <laughs> um, and I can name a few others. I actually, Jane Ann Phillips, and I think when, when she first published Black Tickets, that was that sense of, of a, a writer who was only a little bit older than me kind of coming out with a book that I thought was very daring and also in many ways didn't, didn't conform to what women's writing should be. Um, and then writers like Grace Paley, who was a teacher of mine, incredibly uh, formative. And I think Joan Didion, who I just adore beyond belief. So I think there are women writers who I like a lot. It's interesting, my literary sort of mentors, for the most part, are men. And it goes, it actually starts with playwrights like Edward Albee and Harold Pinter. That's come out. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, there's also like women plays like Carol Churchill, but Carol Churchill is a very unusual playwright, and I would say doesn't write like a girl, whatever that means. Um, I think that there's also a thing that I, that until this book came out that I'd really been loath to accept was true, which is that historically people have always said that there was a difference between men's fiction and women's fiction, and that women write domestic books and men write the larger the, the, the larger kind of political and social book. And I never really was willing to accept that. And then when this came out and some of the responses was like, there's too much that happens in this book and it's too big and it's too whatever. I thought, oh right, I forgot. I didn't write a girl book. Um, which, you know, and I, I just never wanted to believe that. And now I do believe it a little bit that there is some, whether it's, I think it's not intentional bias, but I think that the idea is that women should write books that are about the family in the small sense. And this, what's interesting is really, this is a male and female book. It's a transgender book, no it's not. Um, well, actually it's one little transgender part, but um, something for everybody. But it's, I think it is a large scale book about this point in time in America. And it's also a book about family. Um, so. Well guys, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions.